A proud supporter of this program, Riverbend Food Bank's vision is a hunger-free Iowa and Illinois. Whelan Presley Funeral Home and Crematory has been serving Quad City families since 1889. Whelan Presley Funeral Homes are located in Rock Island, Milan, and Reynolds and are proud supporters of WQPT. Getting a better job, what employers say they need but can't find, and what workers need to do to move up. Plus, making the easiest jobs almost impossibly difficult. That's what the Putnam Museum is doing in the cities. The latest unemployment figures are out and Iowa has a 2.5% jobless rate. It is the third lowest in the U.S. behind Vermont and North Dakota. Illinois comes in 35th, but its rate is just 4%. And we're getting mixed messages this week as Deere and Company announces 150 jobs cut as work scales back at two factories. Yet a number of businesses are preparing to hire right now for seasonal jobs. The people in charge of employment services in Iowa just expanded their offices in Davenport and have programs to help both workers and companies. And joining us is Martha Garcia Tapa from Iowa Works, which is now located next to the hy V store on Kimberly at Eastern Avenue. Welcome to your new digs. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. First off, when you look at that unemployment number, there's, there's a thing called near total employment. Um, where there's, you know, you're going to have that jobs that are open and you're going to have people that are not employed but aren't necessarily actively looking for work. Does that make it tougher? when you are this close of a low unemployment rate to find people jobs and find workers, work, uh, find companies workers. So th that is, the unemployment rate is at an all time low, but there are still people still looking for jobs that need to get placed as located workers. So there are jobs available and companies, you know, are looking for those skilled employees. So what makes it difficult is do they have the skills and what programs are there available to help them have those skills? But it is attainable. I mean, you can have folks that you know, can be placed in positions despite the old time low of unemployment and the companies, you know, looking for those folks. Well, let's be honest, there's a lot of people who want to move up as well. Exactly. So that's where the training comes in. But I thought it was interesting because you had a workforce, workforce study of, of employers who was released in July and it said four of the things that they noticed was that um, this, the, the, the people that were being hired lacked motivation, was one of the biggest problems, dependability, time management, and commu communication skills. I, I, I wonder, I, I bring that up only because, is that, a, is that a question about society when you're talking about uh, motivation and dependability? You can't really teach that. You can't really train that, can you? Well, and, and that's, that's a great question because Iowa Works specifically has 25 different workshops that can help with that. So we work with folks to like improve their soft skills, their communication skills. And so these workshops range on how to interview, how to keep that eye contact. What do you need to get your foot in the door? And if you need those soft skills, what are you lacking? So we have a great group of folks at Iowa Works right now that help the people that need help in those areas. And you, I mean, a workshop's a workshop, but at, mm -hmm. like I said, with 25 workshops, who knows where you can get after, you know, a couple of times you're in our office and you register for these throughout, we can prepare you for the workforce. But you must hear that time and time again from employers, is, is, is that they're almost recycling through people because they see the same problem over and over again. Other than a work uh, shop, what else can be done? Well, and, there, and that's the thing with skills and, and, and like you said, the motivation. Right. Um, and, and we're going to segue to Future Ready Iowa because we have identified through, you know, the governor's tax force say, task force saying that, you know, by the year 2025, these folks have to have the skills. They have to be able to have some kind of certificate, some type of, a credit, type of accreditation or degree. So in that skills building and the funding for those skills building, those programs will, are available and will become available either through a registered apprenticeship program through our title one programs mm -hmm. so there are ways to get folks prepared ready for the workforce to make them responsible to have that motivation to get them you know what's the, you know get them excited about going to work and keeping those skills and at the same time having the employer be happy with who they've hired because I would think sometimes as far as the employer is concerned they're looking to build a team whereas some workers are just thinking of it as being an individual thing it's my job 
I'm not part of something bigger. That must be one of the things you try to really knock down and create a different uh, different way of looking. And and that is, and, and we go back and maybe a workshop is not the, you know, the best way to put it, but we have, for example, our Promise Jobs program that helps folks be sustainable out in the community, whether to getting them ready, you know, I've never worked a day in my life, what do I need? What skills do I need? Can I, you know, be placed somewhere to get that s training to be able to say, I was part of a team to make that happen. And those are the things that we are doing under one roof. It's a one-stop shop. So it, we were very excited to invite people to come in. And you know, you may have those folks that want to change careers. Right. I've been in the same job for 20 years. Is there another fit for me? Is there a way that I can transition into maybe a registered apprenticeship program? And I wanted to talk about that because we started this program by talking about the 150 deer workers that are in definite uh, layoffs. They don't know what the future is. And, and you get to a certain age, some of these employees, and they, I, I, you know, you just go, what is the future? I mean, is it important to look into Iowa Works even before you may be laid off or, or close to being terminated in some way? So we encourage everyone, you don't have to be without a job. I mean, you could mm -hmm. be looking for a transition, you could be looking for you know, a, a new opportunity. So if you're having those thoughts, I mean, that of, of moving or thinking of a career change, you know, we have the iowaworks.gov where you can navigate and say, okay, let me look at the labor market information. Let me see what jobs are out there. If I need that job, what do I need skills wise? So they can come into our office and we will pair up somebody with a career planner and then we can help you kind of navigate that kind of harried area because it's like you may not know but let's say you have skills here that could be built in a you know area that could give you a great opportunity somewhere in the in the working force well and and let's be honest I mean the price is right too is it not Yes, it is. I mean, yeah, that we don't, and anybody that comes in, we, it's free. It's free. <laughs> it's, yeah, free. Yeah, it's free. It's <laughs> free. And, and, and so it, it's, it's silly not to take advantage of this. Exactly. And then the other thing is we always say, you know, we are the employment agency. Mm -hmm. We're not an unemployment agency. We're the employment agency with a lot of resources under one roof. And, and we're excited to tell folks and tell your kids, tell your teenagers, if your teenagers are struggling, what, what kind of career should I be looking at? Come on in. We have, like I said, the folks that may be able to guide you in a better direction to give you maybe just an idea as to what our community looks like in terms of our workforce. This survey also of uh, companies and employers that was released in July also pointed out that you, uh, that you, that companies had difficulty filling positions because a lack of qualified applicants, particularly in some fields, a general lack of applicants when they put a job posting out there, also the type of work and the pay offered, they said, often is uh, something that is a, a, a hindrance to getting new employees. And, and that is, and that's why when we say with this Future Ready Iowa, um, initiative, we are trying to look at that and it's like, what are the issues that are affecting employers? What should we be identifying as the, the barriers that are keeping employers from getting good employees through the door? And so when we talk about that, you know, are, are we competitive enough? And that's when we say, we always refer even the employers, take a look at that iowaworks.gov, look at labor market information. How do you compare to other companies in the area? Are you being competitive enough? You know, what are the skills that you're requiring that Brand X may not be requiring? So those are all the things across the board that companies are looking at and that, you know, in future employees are looking at. Well, and we heard time and time again also that it now's the time to break barriers. More women should get involved in, in engineering programs or, or construction jobs, just breaking those barriers because employers are looking for people of that type. I mean, they, they don't want the basic white man getting a job, they want to increase the workforce in different ways. Exactly, and, and now I'm gonna use this example. For example, yesterday we had a manufacturing event with our sector board, um, and we're enticing kids at a young age, sixth graders from all over the Quad Cities came through, and they learned, you know, in simulations, how to navigate, uh, you know, the welding area, the, you know, CNC area, or let's say you wanna be an electrician, or the virtual, you know, how, how virtual reality works into all right. this, or packaging. So those those kids or those teens took a look at this is this is our future. You know, do I fit into those? So when we're looking at this, you know, we're starting young. We're getting that out there across the board. So it's men and women, and it's people of other barriers. For example, the ex-offenders, folks with disabilities. We work with those folks as well. Do you have something a special skill that maybe a company may be looking for that you may not know just because you have a disability or, you know, you did. Some time. There are companies that are looking at those options now. And Iowa Works can be that match.
matchmaker, so to speak. Exactly, exactly. One way to look at it. Let's talk a little bit more about companies because we've been talking about the workers and I know that you have a Davenport Future Summit that's going to be held uh, Friday, October 18th. Tell me a little bit about that. So the summit is we're bringing employers together yeah. and the reason we're bringing the employers together is to, to discuss issues that are affecting the workforce here locally and maybe identifying how um, as a whole, you know, with economic development, with, you know, looking at the labor market and looking what our future holds where where do we sit where do we you know how are we doing these initiatives to make things happen to bring the right people through the door through all these companies so it's kind of like a we bring you know the employers and and we hear what they have to say and then what do we have to do next and so that's ideally what the future ready Iowa summits are is to find ways to you know through because by like I said 2025 everybody's going to need some kind of certification education you know something the training and the skills to have um, to be able to keep a job in this area. But we're also seeing a big change in how um, uh, workers look at employment with the whole gig economy, as it is called. Um, the, the flexible hours, the working from home, the, the non-traditional way of doing work. Is that what we're gonna see more of? Well, and, and it's funny you should mention that because it is, it's kind of a way a lot of companies are going to, let's say, just try a person out and see, you know, mm -hmm. how they're going to, are they going to be able to do this job? Or, you know, maybe it's a way that we talk about the millennials. Um, maybe they just want to try a job for temporarily to see if it's a good fit for them. It, it is a trend. We see that. Um, so companies are kind of, you know, let's experiment with this. So. You know, it just depends on what the needs of the company are and if it's a position maybe they're trying out that, you know, maybe this isn't the right fit right now, but right. let's give it a chance. You know, see if we can get somebody in there to learn the job and then potentially hire them full time. Because let's be honest, some of the workers are going, oh, I'm not sure this is a career. I don't want to spend the rest of my life doing this. The companies are kind of saying, hey, health care costs and all that. Maybe we can find a way to save some money and find the perfect fit. That's kind of the way the economy is going right now? It is. And, well, it is in and it's ways. not. In yeah, some ways. Exactly. And like I said, when we look at, you know, saving, you know, you talk about the benefits, but in a way, what if this person just says, what if I don't like this job? Maybe it's just a chance for me to kind of explore my options. And if I get the training temporarily for this, it'll open a door somewhere else. Once again, you moved into new facilities uh, next to the uh, High V in the old Kaplan College. For those people who know that area, Eastern and Kimberly, what does this new uh, facility afford to, to people? Well, it is awesome. I mean, it is a state of the art with the great equipment. We have a skills lab where they can come in and use the computers to update a resume. Um, we also have all of our partners under one roof. Mm -hmm. and, and for example, our, our National ABLE program, our ARPS, to help folks over the age of 55 look for a job and find a job. We have our Title I folks that help with the training aspect. Um, our vocational rehab uh, with people with disabilities that you know need a little bit of assistance. So it's a one-stop shop with all of these programs under one roof so you don't have to be navigating all over town. So it's a great, great place. And once again, the price is right? The price is perfect. <laughs> <laughs> it's free. Martha Garcia Tapa, thank you so much. Thank you. Iowa Works with the Iowa Workforce Development Center. And once again, you can get more information about unemployment insurance benefits, job retraining, and help applying for work by first heading to the Iowa Works website. It's iowaworkforcedevelopment.gov. Still to come, making things difficult at the Putnam. But first, here's Laura Adams, Out and About. This is Out and About for September 30th through October 7. The Moline Public Library presents a screening and discussion of American Creed on October 7th at 6. The Hallberg Estate is holding a fall plant sale on the 5th. The Village of East Davenport holds a fire muster on the 6th, starting at Modern Woodman Park at 11.30. October 5th features these events. Pups and their handlers join Tales on Trails at Ben Butterworth Parkway for a two-mile walk-run. The Make-A-Wish Foundation holds a walk for wishes at Lindsay Park Yacht Club. Gigi's Playhouse hosts a superhero run walk at Veterans Memorial Park. And the first Zazoom 5K Quad Cities Pizza Festival takes place at Seton School. Hogtoberfest presents Pink Skin Pig Out at the River Center, a fundraiser for Friendly House on the 3rd. Circa 21 and Speakeasy present How Great Thou Art, music of Elvis Presley on the 3rd, and the Tap Happy musical Singing in the Rain. Under the Purple Rain, the music of Prince on the 5th, and Viva La Diva's Drag Show on the 4th. At St. Ambrose, the Middle School Honor Band Festival takes place October 2nd, and Big Fish October 4th and 5th on the Galvin Stage. A new musical, Aaron Power, holds a workshop at the Black Box Theater on October 6th at 2, while Richmond Hills players in Geneseo present One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. For more information, visit wqpt.org.
Thank you, Laura. Lojo Russo describes her music as roots, folk, and madness. Sometimes intense, sometimes outrageous, always original, she says. She's proved that when she took to the stage at Moline's Black Box Theater. Lojo Russo in our spotlight tonight with Street Sing. Lojo Russo and Street Sing. Lojo will be featured on KHOI Public Radio in Ames this Wednesday night at 7 before she heads up to Stillwater, Minnesota to perform next weekend. She'll be back at the Quad City scheduled for Grumpy Saloon in the village of East Davenport next month. Well, why do something simple in three easy steps when you can overcomplicate it in an amazing way? That's the fun of Rube Goldberg creations. And the Putnam Museum is highlighting some contraptions you and your children can get their hands on right now. And joining us is Rachel Mullins from the Putnam Museum. Thanks for joining us once again. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for this having is, me. You were saying this is your first big exhibit yes. that you booked as the yes. new uh, president. Right. I've been in about 90 days. And the Putnam is part of an amazing network of museums through their Smithsonian affiliation and the um, Association of Science and Technology Centers. So we're made aware when there are exhibits that are available and they have a slot open. And we were able to book this 
exhibit um, with about three weeks um, turnaround. Fast, um, yeah. So it was really amazing. Well, it's going to be here to January. Or yes, into January. yes. And those who don't know, you do know Rube Goldberg. You may not know it by that name. You should. Yeah. Is that the contraptions that you do a simple activity, but you do it in a very complex way. Yes, exactly. How do you show that off? Well, Rube Goldberg actually was an illustrator um, uh, from the 1930s through the 1960s and um, would build these elaborate kind of contraptions and uh, a cartoon of how to accomplish a simple task. His granddaughter, Jennifer George, has actually carried on his legacy by creating an exhibit in partnership with the Children's Museum at Pittsburgh. So there are a series of these large machines that uh, children and adults um, can interact with and it's a, simple as like a cleaning machine or a music machine or there's one that's a kitchen machine. Um, but it has all of these different bits and pieces and you have to reset each piece. So it's a great exploration for, for young ones. What I like is how it was described is find the fun in failure. That's right. Explain that to me because I think that's a great way to describe it. <laughs> well, you, when you're watching people actually interacting with these right. machines, you can see them kind of get halfway through and then they realize there's a Wait glitch a so they have to go back and reset. So there's a lot of trial and error involved, um, even if you're watching others um, manage the machines, when you go to interact, you really have to do a lot of the reset yourselves. And then on the interior of those machines are kind of build your own, which are chutes and tunnels and, and um, uh, bells and allowing um, people to kind of build their own machines. Then we have a, a table that's a creative play table, um, which um, domino chase um, is something that... <laughs> Always something, yeah, you have to have Goldberg dominoes in there involved somehow. For. Um, and then there's a final area that's an art studio that challenges students to act as an inventor so um, they can design a complex machine for a simple everyday task and we've gotten some great results from the kids. I, I mean are you surprised? Uh, you know, Because I'm, there is no right way sometimes. That's right, that's right. No, I am amazed that any child, if you sit with them and talk with them, um, will go in, to incredible places. I mean, their imagination um, is just extraordinary. I'm also surprised a little bit at the age range. We had thought that this was about a third to eighth grade um, target uh, for our students coming in, but I'm finding that all ages love it. Really? Adults, yeah. college students are coming in and enjoying it. The high school students, um, they're having a blast. Well, the key to so many of the Putnam exhibits is that it has to have kind of an education component. That's right. A, a, a way to learn something, not actually you're having fun, but you're surprising them with right. some educate. That's right. And that it's for all ages. I mean, we really um, know that our families come not just to watch their children play. Mm -hmm. um, they come to really play and learn with their children. But this comes with an education guide. I mean, is, is there more to it than, yeah. than what the exhibit might uh, be at that first blush? Yeah. Educators actually can use the education guide to do um, in-class activities prior to their visit to the Putnam, but it's also available on our website for families that want to go a little bit deeper in some of those learning standards. I have some other things that you have going on, and, and one of them, and I know it's a short notice for, for our audience, is the uh, Anime Museum, <laughs> the museum-wide anime convention coming up Saturday, right. uh, October 5th. Yes. I mean, uh, tell me about that because, I mean, that has been a real hook for a lot of people over the last few years, anime. Yeah, yeah. so this is the first time for the Putnam. Um, it's going to be an action-packed day. Um, we open at 11, and it'll go till midnight. Wow, and it's yeah. just going to be a variety of workshops. We're going to have a masquerade for the cosplayers to be in full costume. Um, there's going to be um, voice talent there to interact with. So we've got VIPs there. Um, lots of opportunities to... Tell me about that because that part <laughs> I didn't understand quite. Yes. So um, folks that actually are the voices for a lot of the anime uh, animations actually kind of travel to these different really? conventions and they, be, they develop kind of a, a cult following. Um, they're celebrities, truly. And so um, we, we have two with us um, on Saturday that will have a panels discussion going and then also a VIP meet and greet as well. Well, let's be honest, this kind of kicks off a little bit of more events that are coming up at the Putnam in the weeks ahead. Yeah, so it was a great opportunity for us to bring back our Asia collection. And for those of us that grew up in the Putnam, we really remember that Asia collection and being next door with Egypt. And um, so we're bringing some of those treasures out of the vault in time for the anime um, convention, mm -hmm. and that will be um, opening to the public on Sunday as well, and then that will stay up uh, through most of next year, through at least into the summer months of next year. And it is some of our treasures comparing the Shogunate Japan 
era and the Imperial China era of the 1800s. So it's all of the weaponry and armor and beautiful kimonos. Um, we have some large scale food dog um, sculpture, um, cloisonne that are just remarkable. So it's a great opportunity to show off something from the vault. And it's also an amazing local collection it because is. this was actually collected by the Ficky family as well as the Palmer, the Palmer family. family. So tell me about that because it has been stored away for years. Yeah, there are some objects that we'll have on display that have not been seen since the 1960s. Um, so the Putnam was actually built by these founders that mm -hmm. have collected objects from all over the world. Um, they believed that the Quad Cities deserved to have the best in the world, and so they traveled and brought all of these treasures back to our community. Um, we have um, huge collections from around different cultures, but also the big game hunting and weaponry and all sorts of different artifacts and different themes. Um, clothing is a big piece of our collection as well. So we have 170,000 cataloged objects, some 250,000 wow. artifacts in the collection. It's really kind of amazing because when you think of the Figgy Museum, you also think of the Haitian collection, which was yes. also locally collected. It then was. you have this. It was curated. I mean, yeah. this is really something where a generation or two generations ago is already still influencing us today. That's right. That's right. I mean, they might not have known it at the time when they were building what was originally the Davenport Academy of Natural Sciences, mm -hmm. but as they continued to grow the collection, it's just become an extraordinary asset in our community. And you touched on it, but once again, in the middle of the month of October, October 13th, you got some mummies that are going to be roaming yes. around. So tell me so about that, because you know, <laughs> kids love that, and some of us older kids do too. Right. That's actually part of our sensory mm -hmm. film series. Um, so we partner with the Aut Autism Association of the Quad Cities, and uh, they work with us on offering sensory friendly films. Because the large screen is so immense, it is, yeah. Um, and you are right we, up against it. <laughs> we actually offer a um, movie series that is um, kind of brings the lights up a little bit, brings some sound down. Um, people are able to make noise and move around and mm -hmm. things like that. Um, so it, it really kind of broadens our audience for our giant screen theater. So Mummies will be with us. And um, it's a documentary, actually, on um, the excavation and preservation of 3,000 year old mummies just in time for the Halloween holiday. I was going to say, I yeah. mean, the timing couldn't be better, <laughs> could it? We've got a lot of fun stuff coming up for Halloween. And the key is the family. I mean, yes. uh, I mean the Quad Cities does a really good job, I think, for, yeah. for families looking for things to do with their kids. That's right. And we're actually going to be um, doing a little change up in our River Prairie and People local history collection, mm -hmm. offering a haunted history. Um, we're partnering with our local authors, Michael McCarty and Mark McLaughlin on um, distilling some of their ghost stories into the local history exhibit. And then our, uh, we'll also be featuring skulls and the deadhead moth and different artifacts that are a little more eerie and appropriate yeah, for the holiday. Very appropriate. Yeah. <laughs> Rachel Mullins from the Butner Museum, thanks so much for joining Thank us. Thank you. Great timing for this. <laughs> WQPT also has a commitment to military families in the cities. We call it embracing the military. And military dads can take their kids on quite an adventure later this month. The Military Fatherhood Program is offering a free visit to the Pride of the Wapsie Pumpkin Patch on Thursday, October 10th. They'll offer for a hay ride, a bonfire with hot dogs and s'mores, a small pumpkin to pick, and a run through the maze. You can call the Army MWR office to make reservations on the air, on the radio, on the web, and on your mobile device. Thanks for taking some time to join us as we talk about the issues on the cities. A proud supporter of this program, Riverbend Food Bank's vision is a hunger-free Iowa and Illinois. Whelan Presley Funeral Home and Crematory has been serving Quad City families since 1889. Whelan Presley Funeral Homes are located in Rock Island, Milan, and Reynolds and are proud supporters of WQPT.